going to look at uh, a, another kingdom perspective is how do we, how do we, I'm, I want to introduce this thing of work. How many know that many of us, if not all of us, work <laughs> or have worked? Some of us might be retired now. Some of us might be in school. Uh, you might be in uh, high school and you don't necessarily work, but, and, and all of us in between those things. But I think as we introduce work from a kingdom perspective, what exactly should a Christian's perspective be uh, uh, on work B. That's, that's what I want to talk about for the next couple of weeks because work is a major part of our life. How many would agree with that? We spend more time working, some of us, than we do at home, at least our awake hours, that we're more time awake and we're at work than we are even awake and at home. And so work is this big part of, of our lives. And one of the reasons why it's so imperative uh, is, is because we spend the majority of our time doing it. And the other reason uh, is, is because uh, work in the secular environment, we work in secular environments and we don't always connect our faith and our, our, our relationship with God with our work. And, and so God, I believe as kingdom citizens, as members of, of his family, he wants us to understand work. Uh, from that per point of view. Since work is something that is on an ongoing basis, how should we view it? That's, that's kind of the question. And how should we view it in balance with the rest of our lives, right? How many know that work can take over? How many know that we can be driven to work more and more hours and, and to, to, to take care of bills, to, to, uh, to, to, to get promoted, to do a bunch of different stuff? And so... We have to find out how do we balance work with the rest of our lives, especially our faith, especially our relationship with Jesus and his kingdom and our families. Should work be all consuming or not? Should we be working to make a living or living to work? How should we view that? Should we be thinking in terms of our life's work or our work life? Do we work to live or do we live to work? Is Monday just one of those days that we dread after a great weekend or a weekend that we have off? Or is it something that is life-giving or life-draining? We live in a time where work uh, in our culture has become our life. Work has become our purpose. And for many of us, work is what shapes our identity. It's who we are. When you ask, hey... Who, tell me a little bit about you. The first thing we usually will say is something about work. What do you do? That, that's, that's big in our culture. Is, that, that's kind of where we start off a conversation. And it's because we're, we're, we're programmed, we're, we've been taught to, to, to look to work. We live in a time where um, at one end of the spectrum, there seems like people are allergic to work. And if they have any opportunity to get out of it, they will, Right? And in the other end of the spectrum, we live in a time where there's workaholics. If, if this person has the opportunity to, to take up another shift or, or, or to, to pick up more hours instead of taking time to rest or to, to, um, to spend more time with family, they'll opt to take another shift. They'll opt to, to, to take more hours in order to earn more money or to accomplish a goal or to get a promotion, whatever it takes. It's this, it's this place that we live in. But I want you to, to turn to Colossians chapter 3. I want to start off this message series on work and looking at the kingdom, looking at citizens of the kingdom. How do we view work now? And in Colossians chapter 3, verse 22, it says, Whatever you do, everybody say, whatever. whatever. No, say it with attitude. Whatever. whatever. Whatever you do, it says, work at it with all your heart as working for who? For the Lord. Not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ that you are serving. These are, that passage, those two verses there are very important when we begin to, to ask the question, God, how should I look at work? How should I look at my career? How should I look at my vocation? How should I look at my job? How, how do I look at that now that I am your son, now that I'm your daughter? God, what does it look like? And he says, whatever you do, work it out with all your heart, right? Why? Because you're doing it for the Lord as, as unto Him, but not for just the person who's signing your paycheck, but it goes a, a level higher than the person signing your paycheck. How many know that? 
That the person who's signing your paycheck, you're grateful for, but how many know that the reason why you have that check is there's, there's somebody else that's providing that? You see, that's the mindset that we have to shift gears into. We have to shift gear into our hearts. So let's look at really quickly the original plan for work. In order to do that, we have to go all the way back about four or 5,000 years in the book of Genesis. And if we read in Genesis chapter 1, and I'm just going to do a, a very light uh, uh, overview of this just to set the foundation for the next few messages and for this one. It says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, very familiar portion to many of us, but this is where it has to start. This is where work began. Then God said, let us make mankind in our own image and in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all of the wild animals and over all creatures that move along the ground. Verse 27, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. In Psalms chapter 8, verse 3, it says, when I consider your heavens, this is the psalmist, It's David, when I considered your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You've made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands and put everything under their feet. You see, this in Genesis is called what many call, many theologians call the dominion mandate or the Genesis mandate. It is, in my opinion, God's original first calling on mankind. You see, we're all called, and in the next few messages, we're going to look at what's the difference between calling and vocation, the calling and our jobs, and, and how those things can, how do they work together, right? But in this, we're reading the original call upon the human race from its creator. It is to to, to be made in the image of God, but to rule and to fill the earth, to actually create with God, to govern alongside of God, the planet. It's God's original calling on our lives. The truth of the matter is that even if you just take a little, literal reading of Genesis 1 and 2, God has some task in mind for Adam and Eve and for the human race. And work was and is a part of the picture from the very outset of God's plan. Work is a part of God's original creation plan. And God said from the outset, fill the earth and subdue it. How many know that that's going to take some work? How many women know in the house to, to fill the earth that takes some work? Hey, let's not need to leave the men out. How many, how, many, how many men in here say, no, I know it takes work to fill and subdue the earth, right? Yeah, it takes work to do this, to fulfill this calling that God has given to us. The original plan of God involved work, and that's very important for us to hear in our culture because sometimes we can feel like work is a negative thing. Work is a product of the fall of mankind. That work is actually a curse. That's why we feel horrible about it. That's why we hate Mondays. That's why we grumble and complain that we have to get up and go to work, right? Can we, are we being honest today? Is it okay if we just be real? We've all felt that way. Maybe we feel that way more often than we'd like to admit. But the original plan of God involved work in Genesis chapter 2, verse 5 says, now there was no shrub yet ab- uh, that would appear on the earth, and no plat- plant had sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. Translation, everything that was there was because of God, because there was nothing that was capable of sustaining it. So God in creation, in, little, in just a couple minutes, you're gonna, we're going to put this puzzle together, but God in creation did His work, Right? He created all this stuff because there wasn't a person, a man, a mankind to till the earth, to plant the seed, to make it grow. So part of God's original plan for work involved him with us and us with him. Chapter 2, verse 8 says, Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put, everybody say put, he put the man he had formed. Verse 15 in Genesis chapter 2 
So the Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden, Eden to work it and to take care of it. This, this is a quick flyover of, of where work came from and, and what God's intentions were and what his design is for work for our lives today. We have to go back to the original to get the most accurate picture of what work is supposed to be in our life because it has been, it has been hijacked. There's a counterfeit in our culture to what work is all about. And God says, I want to make sure your perspective is right because work is so much bigger than what the culture is selling it to be, is drawing us into. The original plan of God involved work. You see, the impact on the fall on God's original plan is monumental. We know that. The, 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 the historical account goes on in Genesis of how the man and the woman chose to disobey God and go their own way, leave, leave God's plan for their life and choose a different plan. And because of that, relationship with, with God was broken. And because that relationship was broken, the assignment, the call of God upon their lives were, was also broken. And in chapter 3, we, we, we see how God, uh, in chapter 2, we see how God says, I want you to tend and keep the garden. He gave us the job of being many creators and many governors and stewards of His creation. But we see that it was in a relationship. But when that relationship was broken through mankind's choice to disobey God, do it their own way, call their own shots. When, when, when Adam and Eve did that, it says that they hid from God. I want you to know how important work is to God, but I want you to know how important the relationship with you and I is over work with God, okay? When, when Adam and Eve fell, it says that they hid from God. How many know that's a futile move? <laughs> they hid from God. And God came to the garden, as, as it sounds like as He did all the time. It says He was walking in the cool of the evening and He yelled out, where are you, Adam? And they were hiding. You see, God didn't come and say, hey, how come you're, how's your work going? Hey, what's all the, I thought I told you to, to tend and to keep this place. It's looking in shambles. What's, the, what's these leaves that are falling all... What, what are you doing? No, he didn't say that. The first thing he was concerned about is where are you at? God is always more concerned out of relationship even before what he's assigned us to do, right? So this is a picture of, a, of God's heart when it comes to work and this relationship with us. And so in, in this chapter 3, we see how they hid and we see how God is concerned first about them. And we know from Scripture that that work was forever changed for you and I when that relationship was, break, was broken. Make no mistake about it. The fall of mankind in the garden affected every plan God had for, for us, including work. So do you know what that means? We need to be redeemed, but work also must be redeemed. That's very important for us to understand. To understand. It's not just about getting up and going to work because that's what we're supposed to do. It's actually looking to the one who created our purpose and the meaning of work in our life and letting him redeem it again. Amen? Amen. As we read in Genesis chapter 3, to Adam, he says, because you've listened to your wife and ate the fruit from the tree that I commanded you not to, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It, it will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. So the Lord God banished mankind from the Garden of Eden, to work the ground from which he had been taken. Now, one of, the, one of the points is this. Work is not cursed. When the fall happened, God did not curse work. What did he curse? The ground. Cursed the earth, the soil. See, work was well before the fall when he said, I, want you, I put you in the garden to keep it 
and to take care of it, to tend it and to protect it. That's what the original job description of mankind is still today. But in this moment, after the fall, God says the work is going to be much harder now, which causes us to understand something. Before the fall, God says, I just want you to keep it and to care for it. That word keep means to, 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 uh, to actually dress it. How many know there's, it's, a lot, it's a lot different to dress something than to actually have to create it and to cultivate it in order to, to dress it, right? God had done that work. Oh, what God was saying is, well, I want you to take what I've created and I want you to take care of it. I want you to dress it. I want you to make it grow and healthy. I want you to cultivate environments where things flourish. And it says here that now that's going to, now you, he banished him from the garden. Now you're going to have to work. You're going to have to work at the ground from which you were taken at. Now you've got to start from scratch. You've got to do it all yourself because our relationship is broken. And when there's a broken relationship with God, work is always harder. Work is always more difficult. When there's a broken relationship with God. Work was not cursed after the fall, but it did become difficult. It did become toilsome. It did become hard. How many know that the woman was, was also reprimanded by God? It says in pregnancy now, you're going to have difficulty. It's going to be painful. And your desires are going to be towards your husband. Did he curse being pregnant? What did he curse? What, what, this pregnancy is now going to be hard. It's going to be painful. He didn't curse work. He didn't curse having babies. He says, now it's going to be difficult. Why? Because the relationship between you and me is now severed. And, and because of that, things are going to get hard because you're going to be doing it out of your own strength. This morning, in the time I have left, which is not much time, there are, there are two things I want us to get Right. I believe that God wants us to get right in our perspective on work. And number one is this, that work is not a curse, but it's a gift from God. Work is not a curse. It's a gift from God. Work is not a curse. You know why? Because God worked. If work is a curse, why would God do it? Right? God was at work creating, right? You read that in Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 and 3, that God had finished His work, right? Right? Work is not a curse because Jesus said, I am doing the work of my Father. I am always at work. As you look at, at, at the life of Jesus, you see how Jesus worked. In John chapter 3, verse 34, it says, My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of Him who sent me and to finish His work. John chapter 5, verse 16 said, So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, He was doing the work of the Father, the Jewish leaders began to persecute Him. And in His defense, Jesus said to them, My Father is always at His work to this very day, and I too am working. See, work can't be a curse because the Father and the Son are still working. Right? They're still, Jesus is saying, I'm still cultivating, I'm still doing, I'm still working is what the Bible says. It's, not, it's important for us to understand to get rid of that notion that work is a negative thing. Work is a gift from God. Work is not cursed. Actually, work is what we've been, giving to, been given as a gift for purpose. Work is a, is a gift that we've been given from God as a partnership with Him. Work is not a curse. Work is a gift from God to us. It is a gift of partnership. It's a gift of purpose and value. A person who does not work, a person who, does, he don't, they don't feel useful. Even when we retire, we have, to, we have to look for other things that we can still remain useful in. Because we know just sitting around and laying around is a dead-end life. We all know that. That's why you always say when you retired, you're more busier than before, right? Because we're constantly finding purpose and meaning in life and, and work is, is part of that. It's a gift to us. It's not where we find our identity, but it has been meant to give us where we can find fulfillment and joy and, and, and like I said, purpose in our life. Colossians chapter 3, verse 22, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. We were meant to enjoy work. 
Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse uh, 24 says, So I decided there is nothing better than to enjoy food and drink and to find satisfaction in work. Then I realized that these pleasures are from the hand of God. Work is not a curse. It's a gift from God to us. And we must embrace it like that once again. Second and final is that work is how we serve and worship God. Work is how we serve and we worship God. It says the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to do what? To work it and to take care of it. Did you know that our first employer was and is God? He gave us our first job, our first vocation, our first calling, if you will. We are first God's employees before we're anyone else's. That word work in the Hebrew is a very powerful word. It means to serve. And like I said, it means to dress or to cultivate. In the Hebrew, it actually means it's an extension and an expression of worship. The word work also carries with it the strong meaning of worship. So when God put mankind in the garden, Adam and Eve in the garden, to work it, it was to be a form of worship. And this is how we have to begin to think about our work. No matter what we call work right now, whether we're in retirement, how many know you've worked hard to be in retirement? Whether you are a student in school, college, high school, whatever it is, wherever you're at, this place in our lives, or whether you're employed here today, and whether it's part-time, full-time, you're your own boss, you have your own business, you work for somebody else, this place in our life, we have to view it as, God, how do I continue to do what you've started, what, what you gave to us in the beginning, to work and to take care of this planet, of this life of ours. And that first word, work, dress, serve, worship, is at the beginning of it. To care for it means to guard and to protect it. It's this place that we embrace it, that we're aware of it, that we just are not haphazard about our work and what God has given to us. Work, therefore, is first and foremost meant to be how we serve God. Like I said, He is our first employer, if you will. He first gave us our first job, and that job has continued on and will continue on throughout eternity with the new heavens and the new earth. Work can and should be an act of worship for God. Work is one of the original ways mankind honored, served, and obeyed God, which is the highest expression of worship. Obedience, God says, I desire obedience over sacrifice, over all the religious rituals. I would desire that you would obey more than, than doing your own thing and going, okay, then I'll just go clean myself up in, in, in the church. I'll ask for forgiveness. I'll, 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 I'll give more in the tithe. I'll, I'll say a few of the Hail Marys, and depending on what, what uh, tradition you come from here, you know what I'm talking about. How do I get, how do I pay for these sins? How do I take care of my mess? God says, I would rather you be obedient than to do all this. And when we talk about working, especially when after the fall, when, when the earth was cursed, when work became hard and toilsome, it was even then that, that mankind continued to express worship by going to work, by continuing to take care of that Genesis mandate, that, 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 that dominion mandate, that, 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 that mankind was supposed to have dominion and to fill the earth and to subdue it and to, and to, uh, and to rule over it. How many know that hasn't stopped? God's calling on us hasn't, hasn't stopped in that regard. It just had to be redeemed. How many know it, it's been redeemed through Jesus? Amen. We'll talk about that next week. Today... It's just to get our heads screwed on straight with, it's not a curse. Is it hard? Yes. Do we love it? Some of us do. Some love what we do. 
Not all of us hate work. Some we find great meaning. Some we find great purpose. We, some of us love getting up on Monday morning and going back to work. There's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. But God is saying, I want to redeem work in your heart again. Obedience is what God values more than anything else. Obedience is one of the greatest expressions of worship. Work is a means of serving God and honoring Him, but work is also a means of seeing God as we partner with Him. I put down on my notes, if you're retired here today, how many know that God's not finished with you yet? But our culture says that retirement is now you just, you just do you. You've worked your whole life. You've paid your dues. But how many know that God's mandate on your life, the call of God to steward and to, and to fill the earth is still there? The job description to keep or to work and to care for is still upon our lives, even in retirement. So the question we have to ask ourselves if we're in retirement, how am I worshiping God through my retirement? How am I partnering with God to continue His mandate to steward things? Because you are in the sweet spot of your life. You have more wisdom, more experience, and more time than you have ever had before. And God says, man, I am just getting you, I am just getting started with your life. But we have to shift gears out of the culture that says, no, you don't do that. Let somebody else, let the younger people come up and do that. (laughs) If you're a student here today, and you're just going to school, man. It's like, I don't care if you're a college student, a high school student, you're in grade school. That mandate, that call of God in our life. So the question is, is while I'm a student, how am I worshiping God as a student? How am I partnering with Him to continue fulfilling this call in my life? If you're disabled here today, through your disability, God is, His mandate hasn't changed. His call on your life hasn't changed. So the question is, God, how even through my disability can I worship you? How can I work and take care of the Garden of Eden in my life? The Garden of Eden was was nothing more or nothing less than, than, than the place that God gave Adam and Eve. That was their, their Eden, their, their paradise. It was their home. It was So in my home, in my sphere, in my going about God, in my life, how am I working and taking care of things? Still, even if I'm disabled, even if I can't do what I used to do, God says, you're not useless. Don't let culture tell you you don't have nothing to add. God says, you've got a lot to add to my kingdom. You have, a, you have so much to bring to, to, to what I, I created. And, and, and God says, don't lean away from that. Lean into me. I've got stuff and I've got plans for your life. We must view work as a blessing. We must view work as a way of honoring God, not grumbling and complaining about our work because then we're criticizing God's plan for our life. Does that make sense? In closing, work must be redeemed in our life. It just doesn't happen naturally. Even if you love your work here, it can get all twisted up with identity and purpose and money and promotions and chasing after things. And God says, I, I want you to make sure that, that when you've accepted Christ and you've been redeemed, our relationship has been restored, you've been redeemed, that you also know that, and we talked about money a few weeks ago. We we talked about redeeming that, right? But today we have to redeem work. We have to take it back to what its original intent and purpose in our life and at the foundation of it. It must be connected back to Genesis chapter 1 and 2 where it says, you are created in my image. 
for a great purpose, for a mandate, a dominion mandate to rule, to fill, to create, to steward. That's how we have to see our vocations. Next week I'm going to talk about calling and vocations because they're not the same. Not biblically. Oh, they work hand in glove if we have the right priority on them. But today, just begin to say, God, thank you. Thank you for my job. Thank you for my vocation. Thank you for my career. Anytime you're tempted to to grumble and complain, he understands. It's hard. It's complicated. It's toilsome. But as Josh spoke, take heart. I've overcome all of that. I've overcome the world. Do you know that speaks to our our, our work? I've overcome that. Work can be rewarding. I go through McDonald's drive-thru. Don't hate me. Because I love their egg McMuffins. They're only 300 calories. Fairly healthy. Okay, Don't judge me. And obviously I go through enough that I know the people. That's how. Can I just tell I'm a breakfast person? I have to have breakfast. I wake up hungry. That's beside the point. I go through drive, the drive-thru. And the sweetest ladies wait on me because they have this shift, right? And I just tell them, thank you for getting up and cooking me breakfast. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for taking care to, to feed me. How many know food is important to us? It doesn't matter what job you have. Being at McDonald's might, might not seem like meaningful work, but you can bring meaning to your work. And it all starts back with understanding that God is the one that created us to work and he gave us this place in our life. It's important that we redeem that in our life. It's important that we make work meaningful, even if you don't think you're doing meaningful work. It's important that we make it meaningful. And we do that when we tie back in to God and His purpose for our life and that He has not changed His mind. Our work, our career, our vocation, our jobs must be in context and connected back to God's original plan for our lives of work. We must not see it as something we have to do. It's something that we get to do. And I'm talking about the perspective as citizens of His kingdom. Not some sweet by and by, not some, oh, that would be really nice. Like, I'm just telling you the way God set it up, right? As members of his household, as citizens of his kingdom, he has redeemed work back to this original plan in our life. Work was not cursed, the earth was. Even though work is hard and toilsome, we can find tremendous purpose partnering with God to fulfill fulfill that. So number one, work is not a curse, it's a gift to you and I. Point number two, work is one of the greatest expressions of worship, if we will do it unto him. Colossians chapter three, very clear, whatever you do, work it out with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance. Think about that. You go to work and you work for the Lord when He's your first employer. You work for Him. There's an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. He rewards us. He gives us bonuses. He's the first one that put this bonus plan into place when you worked hard. When you worked with integrity and you worked with diligence, no matter who's watching or who's not watching. He says, I see and I will reward you. You may think you're getting passed over promotions, but promotion comes from the Lord, the Word says. He doesn't miss a moment. He doesn't miss the extra effort, especially when you say, God, I feel used, but I love you and I will do this for you. I will work any day for you, God. Let's bow our heads. 
as we're talking about this whole thing of work and and today I told you that God redeemed and restored the relationship that was broken back over four to five thousand years ago the relationship between mankind was broken and today as we talk about redeeming work the first thing to redeem is not work the first thing is to redeem is to restore the the broken relationship between you and God because that's why life is so much harder because without him we're just on our own figuring it out and today if you're here and you do not know God you have not accepted Christ as your personal savior he is the one that God sent to restore the relationship that's why Jesus is so important to the Christian faith because without him nobody paid for the for your sins nobody Nobody cleaned up the mess that separates you from God. Jesus did, and Jesus does, and he's here today, but, but the relationship must be redeemed first. And if you're here this morning, and you're far from God, you're running from God, you, you've never even taken the step of faith to say, I'm going to choose to believe in you, God. Today, you can do that. It doesn't matter your past. doesn't matter what you're even into presently. God says, come unto me. Confess with your mouth that you believe in me, that you believe in my son. Confess with your mouth that you believe that Jesus is my son and that I raised him from the dead. Ask him into your life. Ask him into your heart. Ask him to be the Lord of your life. God says, I will redeem that really. I will restore that relationship and I will begin to redeem and restore so much more in your life, work included. But it all starts with a decision from you. And from me, it's our choice. That's what love does. Love gives, love gives choice. That's how much God loves you. So this morning, if that's you, ask Christ to be the Savior of your life. At the end of this service, I'm going to have some of our pastors and our prayer team members off to the side. We'll have people back at the point. Man, if you want to our relationship with Christ and you just don't know how to do it. I'm telling you how, but I just don't. Please come up. Please allow us to talk with you and pray with you. Today is the day that God wants to redeem and restore every area of your life that is lost and broken, first of all, starting with you. You and you alone. Father, today as we allow you to search our hearts as we end this service, May the meeting with you not end. Just because I say amen and we're dismissed, God, I pray that you would go with us in our cars. Lord, those of us that are wrestling with our vocations, with our jobs, with our careers, and, 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 and we're not finding meaning in them, we're just burned out, God, and, and we're stressed out about it. God, I pray that over the course of the next two or three weeks as we dive into this, that you'd bring healing, you'd bring wholeness, you'd bring fresh vision, fresh purpose, fresh meaning, fresh value to every single one of us as we look through the lens of being citizens of your kingdom and members of your household. We love you, Lord, and we ask you to do this in our life. In Jesus' name, everybody said, would you stand this?